Well, it is Earth Day, so happy Earth Day, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr Tony Curran. I am a member of the University of Southampton's Public Engagement with Research Unit, where I'm a senior public engagement fellow. Uh, and on the side, I'm a bit of an environmental science communicator. So for both of those reasons, uh, I wanted to bring this event to you tonight. So thanks for joining us. Uh, and hopefully you'll find it to be an interesting evening. Today's event relates to climate change, um, but it is focused on nature and biodiversity predominantly. Uh, so we're going to do a state of nature, followed by a panel discussion and some questions from the audience. And uh, it's got a part global and a part local focus, as you'll see uh, as we begin properly. Um, you know, we'll start from the top, we'll think about the global issues then we'll bring it down to the UK and then we'll really look at some local issues as well. So hopefully uh, it'll answer any of the questions that you've got and prove to be quite informative. Lots of other events going on all around the world for Earth Day today, uh, and hopefully that's stirring up a, a renewed kind of interest uh, and, and awareness of the urgency for, for us to act and help protect nature. Um, and yeah, I'm glad that you've joined this event with us tonight. Uh, what I'd like to do now is invite our panellists to introduce themselves. So we could start with Jake Snadden. Hi, I'm, yep, I'm Jake Snadden. I'm a university researcher and lecturer at the University of Southampton, um, where I teach on the environmental science degree programme. This is a programme that focuses on ecology, um, geography and, and, and topics such as um, sustainability, looking at how we can and use those in terms of uh, resource management and conservation um, of our resources. Um, in terms of my research, I'm a, I'm a biodiversity uh, researcher focusing on conservation, particularly in tropical forests, um, but I have a particular interest in insects as well. So, that's me. Great, thank you, Jake. And Jamie Marsh? Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Jamie Marsh. I am the Senior Reserves Manager for the Hampshire and Isle of Wight Wildlife Trust. Um, I've been working in the conservation sector for 20 years now um, and my role at the Wildlife Trust is to focus on the reserves delivery across the estate. Um, I'm based on the Isle of Wight but I lead on delivery across Hampshire as well um, and I'm currently leading on the Wild and White programme um, as part of the Trust's new wilder strategy. Great, thanks Jamie. And Corinne Holloway. Hi, I'm Karen. I'm Vice President of Activities for Southampton University Students' Union. I'm also involved in lots of different environmental groups from conservation volunteers, BioCycle, Campus Collective, Extinction Rebellion, Greenpeace, Marine Conservation Society, Beankeeping, and many other groups where I run and take part in them. Great stuff. Thanks, Karen. And Izzy Sargent. Hi, I'm Izzy Sargent. I came to Southampton in the 1990s to study environmental sciences. Um, I'm now a parent, I'm a chartered scientist, um, but probably one of my favourite things since we went into lockdown is um, really just exploring the very, very local spaces that we have and the wildlife that's around the city. Great, thank you Izzy. Okay, so without further ado, what I'd like to do now is present as an, as an opening kind of, kind of presentation to you, uh, a state of nature. So if I could, uh, yeah, there we go. And uh, I'll get straight onto that. So we all have different feelings and concerns about our earth and about nature from the existential, you know, from ecological destruction and the future effect on humanity to specific causes like plastics in the oceans or the plight of orangutans to local and even hyper-local issues. Could be exasperation of litter on your favorite woodland walking route or seeing yet another neighbor get rid of their green space in favor of a fence, paving or decking. These all matter. And the variety of such concerns underlines the scale of the challenge we're facing. I think there are three steps to helping nature. First, we have to learn about the poor state of nature and about how we can help. Second, we have to care about it. And this means having a connection with nature. Step three is to act. And this can only happen when we're aware of the issues and we care about nature enough to want to protect it. Now we're a bit removed from nature just now, but take a moment and picture it. 
Think about how you feel about it. We have to get people to care if we want them to act. So why should we care about nature and biodiversity? Well, here's a few quotes just to get us started. So biodiversity is key to the survival of life on Earth. That's a pretty good opening reason, isn't it? It's a really good indicator of the state of the planet and its climate. You could think of it from this perspective. We have a moral obligation. How, why do we as one species have the right to drive many other species to extinction? Or you could think of it a bit more practically. The economies of the world would grind to a halt without the services provided by biodiversity. And what are they? Well, this chart shows a little uh, bit of it. So biodiversity is the foundation of the ecosystems which are essential to human well-being. Whether it's from providing our food, water, medicine and materials, regulating our climate and being an important cultural value and benefit to people all over the world. OK, so that's why it matters. How is it changing? Well, you're probably aware of this, uh, but to put a few statistics on it just to get us going, the Global Living Planet Index here shows that since 1970, there's been an average of 68% drop in the number of species or the abundance of each species um, that's been sampled from over 4,000 species. And you can see at the bottom there, in 2014, it was 52%. So it's getting worse over time uh, as well. Another thing you could look at is the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. They have a red list, uh, and this has now assessed 134,500 species, out of which almost a third of them are threatened with extinction. So that means they're at high, very high, or extremely high risk of extinction. Looking across Europe, these two charts uh, show us that um, the conservation status of habitats and of thousands of species that have been assessed are not great. You can see only a minority of them are assessed as good. Uh, and most of them are poor or bad. I'm bringing it down to UK level. The state of UK biodiversity is shown here. So out of 70,000 species across the UK, on the top left, we could look at the red list, which is 8,400 species that have been assessed. And out of those, 15% are threatened with extinction. And 2% since 1500 have already gone extinct. Over on the other side, the state of nature uh, assessed 700 species. And overall, there's been a 13% decline in those species um, since 1970. Looking at birds of conservation concern, 27% of them are on the red list now. And this is up from uh, just about half that number in 1996. And finally, on the bottom right there, the uh, priority species of the UK out of those 214 species, 60% decline uh, over that same time frame. Another um, Thing that you could look at is the biodiversity intactness index and when all countries are assessed alongside each other the UK is placed 189th out of 218 so a quote uh, there from the state of nature is that the UK is among the most depleted most nature depleted countries in the world okay so we've looked at why we should care and what's happening to biodiversity but what are the causes of these changes well here's a comic just to kind of illustrate the fact that it's humans that's the cause it's probably no surprise to you one way of looking at that is looking at all of the, the land mammals that exist on the earth today the dark gray patch in the middle of this graphic is the weight of all of the humans the light gray all around the outside is all of the cattle, the livestock and the pets that we keep for our own benefit. And finally, those small green squares pushed out to the extremities are the wildlife. Uh, so, yeah, we've dominated the earth for our own benefit at the cost of biodiversity. And when we think about breaking down the species by categories, 
uh, here, here, here it is. So exploitation, again, of hum by humans of different species, habitat loss and degradation by humans, and climate change. And this is more and more being the anthropogenic human caused elements of climate change are the three main drivers. So let's look at those uh, briefly, one by one. In terms of habitat loss, uh, for the UK, agricultural change, similarly around the world, is by far the most significant driver of declines in wildlife over recent decades. And the picture there is an example uh, from South America, which uh, is typical of kind of deforestation. So huge tracts of rainforest cleared to grow soy, not for humans, but for uh, animal feed, for cattle that we're growing uh, or you know, rearing for, our, for humans to eat. And I wanted to throw this picture up to illustrate this problem as well. So this is the majestic baobab tree in Africa uh, and loss and degradation of habitats is forcing the decline of most species. But some like this one um, that are less able to move um, find it harder to deal with threats. Another area I mentioned uh, is exploitation. And the simplest way to think about this problem is that we are taking more than the natural world can supply. You can think of this as the bluefin tuna and rampant overfishing endangering them, or tigers. I was watching David Attenborough earlier and hearing that there are only 600 Siberian tigers left, and it's the illegal trade for their fur and their bones that humans uh, conduct around the world that is driving these um, key species to extinction. And then taking the green turtle there, here's a lovely picture of one swimming or floating through the sea, about the size and weight of a human. Um, and the most detrimental human threats to these green turtles is the intentional harvest of their eggs and also taking them as adults to be pets. Um, and incidental threats to them are bycatch and habitat degradation. And the final one of these three main drivers of biodiversity loss is climate change. It's uh, a smaller one than the other two right now, but it's uh, known to be getting worse and will continue to do so. It's one of the greatest long-term threats, therefore, to nature. You'll be familiar probably with the wildfires that uh, gripped countries around the world last year. Climate change increases the frequency and intensity of extreme weather events. And in 2020, we saw the worst uh, wildfires in Australia and America that, that have ever been experienced. Just in Australia alone, uh, more than 3 billion animals are thought to have been affected, as well, of course, as the ecosystems and the ecological destruction that happened. In this book, uh, Richard Pearson documents study after study evidencing how climate change explains coral bleaching, the changing distribution of fish and bird species, pressure on trees, species being pushed out of sync uh, from the changing of the seasons, which causes declines right across food chains. And quite infamously, the case of the golden toad. Hailing from a restricted part of Costa Rica, the golden toad was the first documented extinction of a species due largely to recent climate change. And what happened here was the rising ocean temperatures meant that warmer water vapor began to form clouds higher up the mountain above the habitat of these moisture dependent amphibians. Okay, so the final question, shouldn't we focus on climate change? Isn't that a bigger threat to our planet and humanity than biodiversity loss? Well, using the planetary boundaries model here, biodiversity loss, like climate change, has been pushed beyond the safe operating space for humanity. And Johan Rockström, uh, who was one of the famous main authors of the planetary boundaries, says that our civilization is based on a stable climate and a rich biodiversity of life. And as we push those planetary boundaries towards dangerous tipping points, we all need to become stewards of the planet. Biodiversity loss is scarier than climate change. This is what the WWF Director General said a few years ago. 
Biodiversity is essential to safeguarding the environment and mankind. If we lose the oxygen that comes from the ocean and the forest, we re really are doomed. And this quote about the services provided by nature again, uh, and just underlining all of those benefits that we get. The rate of species extinction is 10 to 100 times the normal rate now. And some people like the WWF say it's much higher and more than 100 species are thought to be going extinct every single day. Climate change is a serious and dangerous issue, but there's a lot of awareness and there's a lot being done. With biodiversity loss, it's out of sight, out of mind. It's too intangible, so people don't connect with it. They're sad when they hear about an extinction, but they don't worry about the problem like they do with climate change. There are movements, though, that are trying to catalyse action. We must repair our planet, said Prince William recently, and with Sir David Attenborough and others, they launched the Earthshot Prize in 2020, which seeks to provide solutions to these five critical environmental issues over the next 10 years. And there are organisations um, such as Extinction Rebellion uh, who are demanding more urgent action. These, they say that Governments are not doing enough. They must declare a climate and ecological emergency. They must act now to halt biodiversity loss as well as reduce emissions to net zero and create a citizens assembly because governments are clearly not acting. And finally, the short version. Biodiversity is critical to our well-being, but we are causing it to fall rapidly. And so we all need to help protect nature and biodiversity. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is invite each of our panellists in turn to give some opening remarks. So firstly, over to Dr. Jake Snadden. Hi, yes. So, um, yeah, Tony, you mentioned um, the, the annual Living Planet Index as, as, as one of these measures of, of biodiversity loss that we, we see annually. These, these reports are produced annually. And so we have these numbers in front of us annually, like you just mentioned. Um, so the 68% decline in annual populations globally since 1970. And these are alarming figures. But if we start to look at them and unpack them a little bit, we, we start to see the details. And, and if we look at this figure of 68% of decline in animal populations um, globally, we start to look at where that is. And, and the tropics are, are sort of, I'm, I'm coming here sort of talking a little bit more global than, than I think the other panelists are. Um, the tropics are an area that have a, 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 a sort of an emphasis and, and, and an alarming rate of decline um, currently. If, if you unpack that figure for Central America, for example, the decline in animal species since 1970 is not, not sorry, not, not animal species, but animal abundance since 1970 is 94% for Central America. So the tropics, the, what's special about the tropics is that they, they have these hyper diverse tropical forests on the terrestrial systems, which are being impacted at alarming rates. And so as we as we impact these systems, the, the, the level of, of impact on these animal communities is very high. So, so as a little bit about myself, so as a researcher, this is one of the reasons that drove me to the tropics as a sort of with a conservation hat on, think, what, what can I do? So we're thinking about sort of 15, 20 years ago now, starting out on, on this journey. And that led me to Southeast Asia um, to look at all palm plantations. And um, I went sort of campaigning, thinking all palm plantations, all palm is bad. It's, all palm is one of these um, crops that we hear a lot about in the media. Um, the big problem with all palm is the loss of the forest. All palm itself is actually a wonderful crop. <laughs> um, I, I'm often quite sound quite pro all palm, but the problem is that it replaces forest, and and there's nothing really that can replace these tropical forests in terms of habitats for, for the species, the, the trees themselves, and and all the animals that live within them. Um, so so in, a lot of my research over the last twenty years has been focused on on looking at how we can manage these agricultural areas in these hyper diverse tropical regions, so we can sort of make them better matrices, but better habitats for animals to live in, better habitats for animals to move through, but also more productive so we can protect the forest where the forest is still standing and have higher yields and higher crops. 
because it is the demand for these crops that drive the deforestation. All palm wouldn't be a problem if we weren't consuming it in the products that we buy in the supermarket. Um, so the real answer to that is perhaps not looking at the biodiversity side on the ground in the tropics, but actually addressing consumer um, issues in, um, in, our, in our days, in our daily lives here in the supermarket. Um, but, but I'm a biodiversity scientist, so it led me to look at the biodiversity side. Um, and, and a lot of the work I've, I've done is, is focused on, on looking at how we can improve these landscapes for biodiversity. Um, the other area I work on is, is Central America, and, and I mentioned before that this is an area that has lost huge amounts of, of wildlife. Um, one of the big drivers here is over-exploitation, there's another thing that Tony mentioned, um, and so the projects here I run look at sustainable hunting practices. So hunting is, is so the, the use of, of meat from these forests as a source of dietary protein is really important for communities, but can we do that sustainably? And one of the things we've been looking at is, is how do we monitor hunting? And we've been developing um, some acoustic methods for monitoring the number of hunting events and trying to match that with um, hunting records and, and looking at population sizes of, of, uh, of these animals in these forests in, so we can get a measure of, of what can be taken sustainably from them um, so we can maintain life, livelihoods and lifestyles as well as that biodiversity. But closer to home, I'm here based in Southampton and my research interests sort of focus on, on my, my first love, if you like, the insects. Um, and um, so the insects, are, I think, are something that we all should appreciate far more than we do. Um, and it, it's looking at even our urban environments, our gardens, and how we can improve biodiversity in, in, in these systems. So the, our connection to nature really does start at home. Um, I'm, I'm a campaigner for the dandelion, and I'll, I'll hand over there to the next speaker. That's great. Thanks, Jake. And, and we'll come back to some of those during the panel discussion, I think. So over now to Jamie Marsh, please. Hi. Um, so I want to concentrate on sort of the UK charity sector, particularly the conservation sector, and uh, what they're doing to address these shocking stats that are coming out in the State of Nature reports. Um, I think it came as a real wake-up call to our sector that, you know, the UK was in such a bad position, you know, as Tony highlighted earlier, one of the most nature-depleted countries in the world. Um, and, it, you know, for years, decades, we've been managing really sensitive little nature reserves to try and enhance and protect our local biodiversity. Um, and it began to make us question whether that was the right approach um, and in fact whether that was the wrong approach um, but you know we're safe in the knowledge that what we've done today has been really important but what it hasn't done it hasn't changed the loss of biodiversity so this has led to this sort of um, rejuvenation of our set in many respects and influenced by big projects like the Nepa State, the big rewilding project in the UK and what the, the evidence that's come out of that and the data that's been shown um, and how successful that has been. So the sector in the UK has, has started to really reflect on this and look at its approach. Um, and locally for us as the local wildlife trust, we've just launched our new strategy, which is Wilder 2020. It's a 10 year strategy with some really pretty ambitious targets. Um, so we're focusing on you know, landscape scale restoration. And along with the other wildlife trusts throughout the UK, Rewilding Britain, RSPB and National Trust, we're all looking at how we can deliver this. Um, and we have these ambitious targets of 30% of the UK land and sea back to nature. So ambitious targets, is it deliverable? I really believe it is, but it's going to take everyone to get involved. And we were talking about tipping points earlier, and, and that's one of the key things. So the data shows that if you can stimulate one in four people to be involved in their local environment in some way or other, that would gather enough momentum to create a really positive change and reverse this decline. Um, so, you know, it's not rocket science, really. We're just giving land back to nature. But the mechanism in which we do that can be quite challenging. You know, we're working at a local level, influencing local parishes, local councils, local authorities, but also at a national level, trying to influence planning and moving away from this sort of economic growth drive to more sustainable planning, sustainable development to focus on the environment. Climate change is, is here and we need to really reflect this in our planning policies. So. There's lots of positives coming up with the agricultural bill, the environment bill. We really need to cement those in place. So, you know, biodiversity net gain, um, carbon capture all become part of this system. So, you know, locally, as I said, we have our wilder strategy, which is focusing on wilder land and sea and wilder communities. Um, and a big emphasis on the wilder community approach is to bring that whole concept of in the environment, biodiversity and nature into the cities, into the towns and engage as many people as possible. Um, through wilder land and seas, 
nature restoration, land acquisition, rewilding are all big programs. Um, but it costs money. It's expensive to manage the environment. It's expensive to buy land. So we're looking at mechanisms to deliver that. And there's lots of emerging markets could make that possible. We have a nutrient neutrality scheme, which is enabling us to buy land and rewild it. So reverting arable land, farmland into nature, rewilding sites, woodland restoration. So there's lots of mechanisms to do this. You just have to be a bit more creative. Um, so there is much positivity. Um, we're also looking at missing species. So things like the beaver are a huge potential for the uh, local environment um, in terms of wetland restoration, carbon capture, water quality improvements. So nature's great eco engineers. So missing species programs are important as well. And they help capture the minds and the imaginations of people. Um, we also are looking at you know, the, the role of flagship species. So things like the white tailed seagull project on the Isle of Wight has really captured hearts and minds you know, inspiring a whole new generation of conservationists to get involved in the local environment. So this is really, really important for, for, for that engagement aspect, inspiring young people, inspiring the teenagers, um, and then getting them to take ownership of their local environment. Um, there's a huge amount of scope for this, for the local improvements. You know, with Hampshire is under immense pressure from development, from infrastructure, um, economic growth, um, and we need to balance that with the demands that this is going to place on our environment. One thing the pandemic has given us is the uh, a whole new demographic of people finding and learning about nature locally. So lots going on, lots to get involved with. But it's also created a lot of challenges as well. So changing that perception of what a local nature reserve is, it's not the same as a country park, it's very different. Um, so there's a whole role of education that needs to come out through these uh, strategies. And again, this is where wilder communities will help deliver this. So lots of positives, um, lots of challenges, but as a movement, as a working in partnership, we can deliver this. So that's me done. Thank you. Great. And I like the positive tone to finish with. There's lots of issues uh, and potential things we can do being highlighted already. And I can see there are uh, questions starting to come through. Uh, what I'd just like to do before we move on to the next panellist to give opening remarks is just remind everyone you can ask questions throughout. Please do put them in your comments. You can tweet them to the public engagement unit as well. And we'll capture them there. Um, and we will come back to them at some point later on. So, so do start asking your questions. And I'll now invite Corinne Holloway to make some opening comments, please. Hi, uh, so I'm mostly going to talk about lo local things you can do and actions you can do to take part in it. Mostly around Southampton, the ones that I've been involved with, but there are local groups everywhere doing similar things to the things and lots of other things you can get involved with or just make personal changes to make these differences. So one thing that I've been quite involved is with involved with is conservation volunteers. So usually we're a university group and we go out uh, every weekend and we do some kind of litter pick or conservation task. So for example, removing invasive lilies from ponds or uh, cutting down invasive species of trees to allow local types to grow. So for example, rhododendron is an invasive species and it doesn't support much wildlife it's not eaten by things and the things that it is eaten by it's it's poisonous too so it affects bees and it affects other animals and it's just quite bad and doesn't feed them in general whereas an oak tree for example can support house and feed hundreds of different species you see uh, squirrels eating acorns and just things eating the nuts from oak trees and things living in holes in oak trees so uh, a lot of the native species are really good for wildlife and we've kind of adapted to it. So we both try to get rid of invasive wildlife so that we have more of the native things and also try to make sure there's a variety of wildlife and habitat and plant life. So uh, even if the whole country was covered in oak trees, if there were no meadows or woodlands or lakes or things, then you wouldn't have that variety and you wouldn't have all that support so even though oak trees are great you also do need a mix of species and have a diversity of different by different life uh, so for example uh, little mice will live in holes in grounds or sometimes they live in holes in other places and you need the different spaces to support different species if you don't have that wide variety then you can't do that so yeah basically biodiversity is very important because everything is connected. If the insects go, 
then other things don't have food. And if the birds stop eating the insects, you might get an explosion in one area which causes other effects that aren't desired. So you need to have the whole balance of everything to make things work, otherwise you have problems. So you can get involved in lots of conservation groups. There will be one where you live and you can get involved, get active and feel really good about yourself. Uh, something specific we have in Southampton is BioCycle. So with BioCycle, we get volunteer cyclists to cycle around, collect people's food waste, so things like orange peels and those kinds of things. And we take it to be anaerobically di digested to become energy instead of uh, getting energy from coal stations or other fossil fuels. And that means it saves the waste from being incinerated and then lost. So there are lots of great volunteering things around. Uh, there's also, we also have a beekeeping group within Southampton University and we look after bees, make sure that they're all right and make sure they're not being poisoned by things like rhododendron by seeing how the bees are acting, whether they are healthy and happy and trying to help where we can because bees are great pollinators, but also just bees alone, honeybees alone are quite limited. So there's over 200 species of bee in the UK. The honeybee is just one of them and it's a great species, but we forget all the other ones because we don't see them as much and because they don't make honey for us. So all of the species are really important because they pollinate things differently, they act differently and they provide food for different animals. Yeah. Other ways of making changes are through politics and things like that. So there's uh, the kind of most direct way is just to email your MPs and say, I really care about biodiversity loss in this space. Uh, this wood is being cut down. Please vote against it. Please try to prevent this. Uh, and then trying to get the MPs and councillors to do what you care about. And also uh, political groups such as Greenpeace and Extinction Rebellion. So. Uh, I think in the last few years, groups like Extinction Rebellion and Greta Thunberg with her climate strikes, they've been gathering a lot of attention, they've been making media and they've been getting people to care a lot more about climate change. And I think that's one of the reasons why it has raised up the agenda. The UK declared that we were, in, the UK Parliament declared that we were in a climate emergency two years ago after 10 days of protests uh, solidly in London. Uh, and so it does make a difference, it does get noticed. Although the ecological bit is also sometimes missed from that. So Parliament declared a climate emergency, but not an ecological emergency. And we still need to make sure that they act on that. So joining groups like Greenpeace, Extinction Rebellion and participating in climate, climate strikes does make that difference and makes people notice. Great. OK, so thank you, Corinne. Um, what, you, what we're starting to get a picture of here is that, you know, we've seen the scale of the problems. Uh, and there's no panacea to those problems. And the solution is going to come through actions and effort uh, of lots and lots of people. That's why we all need to act. And it could be in one or two of the ways that, that the panelists have mentioned. It doesn't have to be in all of them. Uh, and just on those bee species that Corinne was talking about, um, again, a negative point is a couple of bee species already did go extinct uh, from the UK in the last couple of hundred years. Uh, and we all know how important they are as pollinators. So again, thinking about the local, uh, bringing on uh, the other panelist, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Izzy Sargent to speak. Thank you, Tony. Um, yeah, I think Corin brought a lot of positivity. I'm sorry, I'm going to bring it slightly back down again, but, but for a reason. Um, I said one of the things that I've been doing in the last year is poking around the local areas in Southampton. Um, and it's only when you start to focus on on very, very local, very single areas that you really start to notice the changing state of, of nature. Um, I don't know if other people explore places like Itchin Way, but during the summer, I'm quite sure that didn't used to have quite so many vines and quite so many balsam that seem to be now choking out what I was used to finding up those lanes. Um, I'm noticing things like Bird songs very different, for instance, around the edge of the common because of the noise and light pollution. Um, we've discovered deliberate acts of interference with badger sets and also woodlands that we love with with the corners being nibbled away for, for a housing estate and, and that housing estate then leaving spoil from the building works just within that woodland, a beautiful place like Marlhill Hill Cops um, 
has got building waste around the edges for that reason. And also people just dumping their waste in, in frogs, cops, monks, brook, greenway, places like that. And the reason I'm mentioning all these very local places, very important places, um, is another aspect of us affecting the environment in this way. And it's quite hard for me to say this, but I, I find each one of these, um, I experience it quite viscerally. There's kind of an ache. And whilst each one is probably not a particularly big thing on the grand scale of things, um, you know, there's a lot of worse things perhaps you might think going on in the world. By noticing this, um, I'm left with a, a kind of a sadness, perhaps perhaps it's grief, a, just a constant feeling that, that it's not right, things aren't right. And I wonder how many other people are actually experiencing that. You know, feeling things as an emotion. And I'm a scientist. Um, I'm, I'm trained to look at things theoretically dispassionately. Um, and I can't do that. I don't fully understand the processes that are going on because I was never a, a biologist. Um, but that doesn't really matter because the experience is, is an emotional experience. And I, I wonder not only those of us who kind of see it happening, observing it consciously, are people experiencing this in, a, in an unconscious way and is it affecting our mental health? Um, so this is like, this is the natural world. It's, it's our foundation to our existence, to our survival. Um, and it's clearly in a desperate state. I hadn't actually realized, Tony, that it was um, quite so bad in the UK compared to other parts of the world. I thought we'd got off lightly so far. <laughs> I hadn't realized. Um, and yet our society, it seems to have turned our priorities upside down and, and encouraging us still to do that by, by encouraging us to value the cars we drive or the trainers that we wear far more than than this natural world that is so important to us um so i think what i'm trying to say there in a, in a sort of roundabout way is that there's a lot of statistics that we're measuring about the environment um, and there's policies that we could be writing or perhaps have been written but actually a lot of this is is um, it's, a, it's an emotional experience that people are having. And I think that is actually something that we need to start bringing out and talking about too. I'll leave it there. Yeah, great. Thank you, Izzy. Okay, so we've heard from the four panellists. Um, what I'd like to do now is bring them all into the stream. and We'll start having a kind of a more open panel discussion. And we'll bounce a little bit, you know, we said we'd do a part global, part local um, focus for this event. And we will uh, keep trying to talk to both of those um, scales. Let's just kind of go local for the first one. Um, and I'm going to go straight with a question from the audience. Um, what do you think local employers and economic development organisations should be doing to address biodiversity loss and climate change? Anyone want to go for that, panellists? What local employers in particular could or should be doing to address these grand issues? Yeah, I'll step in, Tony. Um, I think there's a lot of things local employers can do. And, you know, firstly, look at their carbon footprint. You know, um, technology is improving all the time, um, depending on the, the sector they work in. But look at their carbon footprint. Could they be using electric vehicles, um, electric power tools now? You know, technology is improving all the time. So there are, are other options for the traditional sort of carbon hungry um, energy things that we've got so used to using. Um, it can be simple things as well, you know, looking at servers and cloud based storage. Um, you know, it's easy to think of we're all IT savvy now, but those big servers in those warehouses take a lot of energy, a lot of air conditioning and use a lot of carbon. So um, thinking about your business as a whole. So there's lots of options, you know, incorporating solar panels, um, even having your workforce do volunteering for local charities, giving something back to the community, you know, looking at uh, planting schemes, tree planting schemes, getting wider involvement with um, organisations such as ourselves. Um, so there's a lot of options um, for, for people to get involved and, you know, 
improve their environment for not only for their employees but for you know their local area as well. Good. Anyone else? Izzy, would you like to say? Yeah. This is slightly controversial, but um, quite often when you look at a, a economic forecast for for businesses, business plans, I'm not sure that they take into account the changes that we're expecting to see in the environment and in climate. And I think they really should start doing that because there are some businesses um, that frankly don't seem viable when you put into um, into the, uh, the, the statement the what's going to happen to the climate and what's going to therefore happen to policy. So I think actually it's about projecting forward and realistically looking at whether it's even a viable business. And if it isn't, making it one for the long term. Yeah, I, I think I, I second both of those ideas. Just on, on Izzy's point, I think that speed, I think if it was an economic question, I think there would be the changes would happen much faster. Um, and, and But we need the, these changes are happening. The environmental changes are happening now and, and, and we need to be quicker. And, and so looking at, as a business, looking at how you make changes and, and being faster at that, um, I think is important. And on, on Jamie's point, I really like the idea of, of, of engaging the workforce because of being informed and being being aware of, of what's what's around you and, and often through organizations like your, your workplace you can engage with these organizations like the Wild Bear Trust and, and other volunteering um, activities that, that Corinne has mentioned and things and so it's it's a great thing for all, for employers to, to do to, to engage their, their workforce. Yeah. So my employer is the Students' Union so because of how Students' Unions work it naturally cares about the environment because students care about the environment uh, so we've been trying to make or they've been trying to make personal changes within the organization of reducing their main impacts which generally the main kind of drivers in my experience are kind of things that make heat so trying to make sure that heat isn't you, you don't create heat where it's not needed and keep windows closed and keep heat in and make sure things are properly insulated uh, making sure food that it's kind of easy to get kind of cheap food that's plant-based or at least not beef mostly uh, and try to reduce travel and make it easier to not fly or get to work uh, by cycling and this year especially so people can come into work virtually and in future with the, the student union is planning on continuing lots of virtual work so we don't have to have all that travel expense and travel emissions and I think a lot of organizations will need to get used to that and instead of flying off uh, for a conference we'll have to kind of do more virtual meetings and making sure they're not doing loads and loads of travel and encouraging employers to just work from home uh, where they want to and it's easy uh, and for a lot of things in terms of mental health uh, having to having really long commutes to and from work is actually quite bad and makes it a lot more difficult to go spaces. It's good for kind of people's mental health to not have to go and travel really far, uh, or at least very often, especially if your work is an hour away each day. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and I think to finish that question off. Um, about lo what local employers can do, you know, two of the biggest employers in the city are the local, the city council uh, and the University of Southampton. And so, just kind of almost giving a point f on behalf of both of them for a moment. Southampton City Council has its Green City Plan. You might have seen it. Uh, it launched 2020 uh, with a plan for the next decade, uh, and it has five themes in that plan. One of them is our natural environment. So again, just trying to bring the conversation slightly back to nature biodiversity. Um, in that natural environment theme, uh, you know, they have got plans to introduce new wildlife meadows across Southampton, increasing tree coverage in the city and creating green corridors, both for people and for wildlife. So that's uh, some of the things Southampton City Council are doing. Uh, and in terms of the university, um, we've signed the the City Council's Green City Charter, uh, among other uh, employers across the city. Uh, and we have our own sustainability strategy just launched. Again, just like uh, with the uh, the countdown movement, just like with the, uh, the, um, the, 
the Green City Plan of the City Council uh, and the um, the David Attenborough um, and, and, and Prince Philip initiative to, to tackle issues over the next decade. Our strategy is also really quite ambitious and trying to do things now, not like many bigger institutions like governments uh, are saying by 2050, but here are all the things we're going to do by 2030, which includes, for example, reducing net zero emissions to 20 uh, to zero uh, for scope one and two emissions, but also um, local actions and local benefits here in Southampton and in terms of the local nature and biodiversity. For example, we have you know green spaces on our campuses and uh, the Great Valley Gardens, so restoring those habitats and doing that kind of work as well. Okay, um, I feel like we're kind of on the defensive a little bit and, um, you know, thinking about the negatives again here. So um, we're, we're right to be, aren't we, panel? Because we've, 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 we've painted a pretty bleak picture so far, both in my slides and in a lot of the comments that you made. Um, you know, nature is undergoing pressure and lots of local concerns. But are we right to be pessimistic? Are there some positives as well? I, I can I jump in here, Tony? I, I think um, I think the, the picture is bleak, but I think one of the positives is is the 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 increased ease I think that you, we have as citizens to get involved in things, and so whether whether that is in in, in um, local green spaces or local organisations or things like citizen science and, and getting involved in in data collection and and, and being part of of. Um, the process of, of uh, sort of conservation and, and, and that, that practice. Um, I think that, that really um, gives people a, a, a really good idea of what, what is going on and, and, and what is happening within the world. And, and the, the increase in the chance of doing that is, is, is much higher than it used to be. Mm. Good. Anyone else? Yeah, Jamie. Yeah, I just want to come in. You know, it's, it's very easy to feel pessimistic. You know, the stats are inherently depressing um and with you know covid and the global pandemic you know it's an enormous situation we're all facing at the moment so pessimism is is high um but as jake said there are lots and lots of positives to come out of this and you know we have the opportunity to change this it's not too late so that message has to be driven home um but i also think it's key that you know all this negativity and all these you know these you know these depressing stats can also alienate a lot of people that are key to the future and the key to the change in the future as well you know we really need to think about how these messages are coming across to young people you know all, all your all children all young people because constant bombardment of negative messaging is going to alienate them away from this so we really need to be careful how that's done and you know and emphasize at the point that although it is bleak there is real hope and it's your generation that can change it um so i think that's one of the key things to come out of this you know and there is definitely hope and there's movement and there's change on the horizon so um i think we just need to keep the momentum going and certainly as a sector that's what the ngo conservation movement is going to be doing pushing for those changes mm. great and corin you wanted to say something yeah uh so it is quite a bleak situation the climate and ecological crisis is really bad and it will be devastating uh and we do need to act on it. But we have managed to change things in the past before. We've had to completely change lots of things. So if you are someone, told someone 500 years ago that they wouldn't be ruled by a king and that they'd be able to vote for their leaders and be able to decide who they wanted to make decisions and could be involved in making those decisions and making the positive change to the, their own lives and the community, uh, they may have laughed at you and thought, that's ridiculous, that's not going to happen, the king's in charge, we can't do anything about that. So we have made huge changes in the past. And as well as things like that, things like uh, slavery ending, that was huge and very expensive, but that happened. And loads of other movements which have managed to make that change. And just within the last year, uh, we've completely changed our lives. So for me, for example, I if I get COVID, it's very unlikely to be uh, kind of hugely detrimental to me. Uh, but I've been staying inside, keeping distance, completely changing how I do everything for myself to keep other people safe. And so have the whole country, the whole world have been doing that and making those huge changes to keep others safe, to keep the elderly, vulnerable, sick, to make sure that they don't get sick. And these are the sorts of changes we will need to 
deal with these crises. Uh, and it's shown that we can make those changes and we can do that. Mm. Okay. Izzy, did you want to add anything? Yeah, it was, uh, well, um, the point that Corinne makes, I think it's a really powerful one because in February 2020, people were saying we couldn't go into a lockdown. We certainly couldn't do video conferencing as our daily normal meetings with work. And now it's completely normal. And, and we don't even really notice that massive discontinuous change that's happened in society. And it all happened because people started standing up and, and telling the truth. And the truth is pretty bleak. And so I think it's really important that we talk about it exactly as it is, because we can change things as a result of doing that. Mm, yeah, we can change and, and we are changing. Yeah, there's still lots of problems. Um, you know, some things are getting worse, but there is definitely silver linings and ways that we can change for the positive. Uh, there are more questions coming in from, from those watching, uh, but I just wanted to make sure we cover this one because it was in the event description. I questioned if governments and local councils are too focused on economic recovery as we move out of the pandemic, but also if the limited bandwidth they have for tackling environmental problems is really all channeled on the climate emergency, you know, with COP26 coming up as well, um, rather than this broader climate and ecological emergency uh, that many groups are demanding action on. Do any of the panellists want to answer that on behalf of um, the government and local councils? I think there are plenty of jobs um, in, a, in a sustainable future, in a non-carbon based future, in a future that doesn't destroy the environment. And we just seem to forget that and think about the economics is separate to the environment. The two things are entirely related and we should be acting as if they are. Yeah, yes, going back to your opening, your opening, your opening remarks, Tony, uh, that biodiversity and, and a stable climate are, are really key for, for the economy and, and society. And, and, and so, it, yeah, they need to be right up there managing that to, to manage the economies long term. Yeah. Current. Yeah, yeah. The the economy and the environment are the same thing. So the Stern report was released. I can't remember how long ago, but it basically did the, all the maths and said it will be more expensive not to do anything about climate change and the ecological crisis than the cost of trying to make all the changes that would happen. So there will be real costs involved in not doing this. So solving these crises does also fix the economy and prevent a worse economy, basically. Yeah, and Jamie? Yeah, I think everyone, everyone else's comments have hit it squarely on the head, you know, and the emphasis that, you know, this is a situation that's happening now, although we're not maybe seeing the actual direct impacts of what climate change will do at the moment, it is happening and it is coming. And unless we do something about it, you know, we're going to be in serious trouble. So. But I think that is often because it's not relevant now, it sort of slips down the agenda slightly. But, you know, when you look at the planning and everything else, the, the real, unrealistic housing targets that all of the local authorities are faced by, it's just, it's just, you know, it's just not sustainable, either in terms of, you know, development or impact on our environment or utilities and everything that goes with it as well. So there are some serious challenges ahead. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, kind of... Bringing in slightly one of the questions from those watching um, and touching on the point about, uh, you know, climate change as well as the, as the other big issue. COP26 is coming up and the UK is hosting it this year and there's going to be building momentum for us to, to catalyse action, both, you know, globally, uh, but also in, within the UK uh, as we build up to that. And as a very brief side note, hopefully we can do some kind of panel discussion locally again like this. Uh, at that time, focused more on climate. Um, but thinking on the nature biodiversity side, uh, as we're currently talking about, um, and I don't know if the panellists were aware of this, but one uh, person watching raised COP15, or the UN Biodiversity Conference, as it's also known, taking place in China later in the year, um, and maybe whether that's a catalyst for action uh, or, or what we would like to see from that um, climate conference on biodiversity. Anyone want to talk to that question? 
Jay? I think I think the key thing is um, they talk the talk, but you have to walk the walk as well. So um, it's great coming out with all these ambitious targets and plans and what you're going to deliver, but just deliver it. <laughs> I think that is the key thing. So um, and I think that's there's you know worldwide government have failed to do that they've spoken the right things but not actually delivered so in a nutshell it's very basic but that's what we need to see happen you know there's a lot of good stuff coming out uh biden's speech today was very you know inspirational really good stuff let's see them deliver it that's what that's yeah. what's needed i think that there could be a particular point on trade i think a, a lot of what keeps our societies running it, it involves trade and that that trade has big impacts in other parts of the world that that um as citizens we don't necessarily see or, or appreciate um and, and and so so i think that 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 mechanisms for for, for looking at that and, and and dealing with that i think is a a key point um for the work i, I do anyway <laughs> yeah anyone else or next question okay so i wanted to bring it kind of around to a bit more local and a bit more personal uh for a question or two um you some people may be aware of this issue others may not more people now live in cities than the countryside children now spend more time indoors than any previous generation and many are no longer allowed outside unsupervised studies have suggested that this is bad for our mental health as well as our physical health but it also disconnects us from nature uh, like i mentioned earlier at this time when nature needs us to care more about it than ever before and want to protect it. So how can we tackle this issue? Yeah, Izzy. This is a really difficult one. I, I believe um, that the main reason that children are not playing out and not roaming as far um, is, is simply traffic um, and the risks that that presents, so very real risks of, of a child being hit by a car or something. Um, I think that says a lot about um, that electric cars are not the solution that continue to be part of the problem. So we actually need to start challenging this, this constantly being pushed that the environmental solutions are things like new technologies like electric cars. Um, I think we just need to start prioritising childhood um, and making it so that kids can be kids again they can get on their bikes and they can make mistakes on the roads and it doesn't cost them their lives and just really just allow children to own the space again yeah it's really important anyone else want to speak to that question yeah jake yeah i, I was just thinking that that i think southampton is, is a fantastic city for for the green spaces that it does have it's, it's a really remarkable city but um yeah, that they aren't used as much as they could be and, and i think getting getting the use the public use of those in, in sort of wider with the communities um it would be really really valuable um in, in terms of the barriers I, I i don't know the barriers as much but but um but but it, it often isn't things like appropriate lighting and things like that we might think it is but actually it's it, it's probably just wider use of those spaces by the general public that, that break those barriers that people think are there for, for children to also use them. Yeah, Corin, and then yeah. Jamie. Yeah, so one of the things which, in my experience, stops people from getting out into nature is just uh, risk. So I know my flatmate uh, does cycling, but doesn't feel very confident on the roads and because they're learning how to cycle it makes it harder to get better at cycling because there's so many cars so just getting out into nature automatically has that barrier and it's hard to remove that barrier without changing everything uh, so there are some things of getting ways of getting making streets safer so i know uh, some primary schools have uh, times when you're not allowed cars outside the primary schools uh, because, for example, during the school run, it's often just car, 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 car. Uh, and they've decided that they're not going to have cars outside the primary school. And even though it's more difficult for the parents to drop their children off, uh, overall, it makes the children much safer and means that they can run around and play in the streets for 10 minutes before school if they want. 
and generally people do support them even if not initially uh, when they have those kind of spaces that have returned to the public and returned to people uh, it's a quite nice yeah yeah jamie yeah i think this links in quite nicely with a question that's come in from rebecca as well about engaging young people so um you know there are a number of mechanisms for this so obviously the school system is there so um education programs so we take conservation environment to the schools or they come out to sites so helping facilitate that because that's a real expense for schools paying for coaches to take kids to visitor centers um education sites things like that um so we can deliver those environmental programs within the school if school grounds as well um, and this is where our wilder community programs which is really going to start off later this year is, is going to help help and have an impact so engaging the community and giving them ownership of projects within their towns and cities um, again taking the green space into the cities we also have our waste of space program as well so looking at areas of wasted land that can be used um, given you know local ownership in local communities um, so there's you know there's a huge range of things we can do um, but also at national level, influencing the syllabus in schools to try and target, you know, all, all ages through the school system. We're really good at capturing primary schools and young people for our school programs, but we start to lose them at those teenage years as those key stages start to develop. Um, so getting them back at that age is really important. So um, influencing education program syllabus is also is also part of the solution. Mm. Yeah, so there's a range of things being mentioned there. That's good. Um, I suppose uh, one other thing that I that I think of there, you know, some of it is the fear, certainly, uh, and the risk um, that's changed in society maybe over time and with increasing vehicles. Um, another bit of it is this disconnect again, you know, what, that I talked about earlier. Part of the reason why we don't love and care about nature so much anymore is we're a bit disconnected from it, you know, and, and some of the nice initiatives I've seen being pushed um, through kind of, you know, NGOs, environmental NGOs, is trying to swap screen time for wild time, you know, doing more to encourage children to to get off their, you know, tablets or, or computers uh, and get out into nature again. And, and again, I want to keep pushing this point. I really think that the more we, we all get out and get our fingers a bit dirty, you know, and experience some really nice connection with nature, it's through doing those kinds of simple actions that more and more, you know, we will realise, we'll wake up and we'll want to stop these things that are happening, um, that, are, that are slowly but surely taking it away from us. Can okay. Uh, yeah, sorry, come on. I'm going to say, add a very quick thing in there, if I can. Drawing is one of, one of our little sort of campaigns. I think we all should draw far more. And it doesn't matter if you're not good at drawing. But if when you connect, when you're outside, when you're experiencing nature, or, or even just when it's sort of sitting not on your screen, if you have, if I ask you to draw an ant, you have to think about where the legs connect to the ant and what how it's formed, and and then you start thinking what ants are like, and it's almost like having that connection. It isn't a connection, but it's better than looking at a picture of an ant if you just draw it. So I think we should all draw outside more. <laughs> yeah, great. <laughs> no, that's nice. Okay, um, I think I'll throw another one in before and then I'll go back to a question from those watching. So th again, this is a very kind of emotive and difficult one. Um, food systems, it's been touched on once or twice already. Um, I'm conscious that some people will have watched the new documentary Sea Spiracy recently. Um, and it described, you know, the destructive nature of industrial scale trawling in the seas, not only driving fish abundance to worryingly low levels, but also clearing marine plants from the seafloor, which, which normally would absorb lots of CO2, um, bycatch of literally millions of sharks and dolphins and, and other species. Um, and then on land, you know, it was talked about briefly by one of the panelists, um, cattle, livestock, um, you know, these beef, meat, methane belching animals as a major greenhouse gas contributor. So, what are the panel's thoughts on this issue? Uh, you know, do we need to change what we eat or how we get our food? Right, I'm going to come in and maybe be slightly controversial, but um, yeah, I think the sea spiracy has really raised a, a, a lot of profile um, for just how, you know, sustainable 
eating fish actually is now um and you know it's, it's led me to stop eating fish completely just because of the the shock of that program which is really quite emotional to watch um and you know question whether any seafood is actually sustainable in the longer term um and i personally feel that it's not so you know um and it's not only like the bycatch and the catching of the the produce it's also the damage to the infrastructure you know you look at the uk 92 percent of our seagrass beds have been lost um and that's a shocking statistic and the amount of carbon those beds store is just phenomenal you know and their role in in ecosystems is just is vast and it's so important so it just gives you an, an idea of what's lost and that's you know mainly lost through dredging and beam trawling so um it's pretty pretty grim so i'm not going out and going to say everyone should become vegan or vegetarian because you know you can eat mouth meat eat sorry eat meat in a sustainable way um, the problem is that agriculture has driven this high yield, high production farming method. Um, so these, you know, lovely lush green fields you see are, are great for fattening cattle. They're not actually that good for cattle. You know, these really high sugar content grasses, Italian rye grass is the classic example. Great for creating a fat cow quickly, but the byproduct is huge amounts of methane, and the cows at livestock get indigestion basically. So, but pasture, on, you know, cows reared on traditional meadows and pasture, slower grown much more economically viable, um, uh, much more econ environmentally friendly, you know, that is an option, but it comes at a price and as consumers, this is where consumerism comes into it. And I think Izzy hinted this earlier, um, you know, we all like to go out and buy cheap food and cheap materials and stuff, but actually as consumers, we can drive that change as well. So how we buy meat, so it's better to buy local, um, local provenance, you know, where it's from, where it's been reared, um, going to the supermarket and buying some shrink wrap stuff that's come from a high production yield. So those are my thoughts on that. Yeah, Corin. Yeah, so I believe that uh, cutting down on meat and dairy consumption is the most efficient thing that you as an individual can do to reduce your impacts on the biodiversity and the climate, because uh, once you're used to it, it doesn't feel that different. It's just kind of normal. And you don't need to go fully vegan all at once. You can just eat meal you choose not to have kind of beef or fish or those kinds of things with. That's an improvement. So just a basic logical step is if you have soybeans, which you're, are being grown in huge quantities, deforesting the Amazon to feed cows. And then if you feed those to cows and then feed those to people, huge amounts of energy are lost in that process of feeding it to cows and the cows becoming meat and then those becoming your food and it's just hugely inefficient it uses so much more land than if you just ate the soybeans or ate the oats or ate the pasta or ate ate the plant food, plant products directly than feeding them to an animal and then eating the animal and a lot of energy is lost it's just very inefficient and once you're used to it in your own life it doesn't make that much difference and you don't need to go fully vegan just each meal you have which is plant-based that's better that helps that makes a difference so i strongly encourage people to eat less veganism is better in my opinion but all the reduction will help and make a big difference yeah, I, I give a talk sometimes called the burger apocalypse and you can see where this is going, can't you? But the main message I give in that talk is uh, for people to reduce how much meat they eat. And also if you switch from those methane producing animals like cows and lambs to pork and chicken, um, then that cuts two thirds of the carbon footprint off as well. Anyway, uh, would Izzy or Jake like to respond? Jake. Um, I think another another thing within this topic is, is are these documentaries and, and the response to them, and, and I think this goes back to the sort of having um, sort of pessimistic stories and opportunist uh, sort of optimism in the stories as well, um, I, and and I think we need the diversity of stories and documentaries. It, 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 it's not that we all we just don't want one one flavour all the time. And so I think they have an important role, the ones that make that forced discussion. And, and, and there may be inaccuracies and then people may be misrepresented within them, and, 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 but it drives that discussion and, 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 and um, makes people aware. But, and, and sort of what I'm hinting at is, is that we actually, we need to be more informed and, and having informed choice really empowers us to make decisions on, on, on what sort of meats, if, if we don't want to give up meat, what sort of meats we, we, would would be better for the environment if we're choosing to eat meat um 
and and this goes back to my old all palm <laughs> story as well all palm if we are going to use vegetables grown in the tropics all palm is actually very good at doing that if we manage it very well and that is possible but the the awareness around what options there are with vegetable oils it tends that when you when you look at the research in terms of um sort of choice around all palm versus another vegetable oil it will go with the other vegetable oil and that may be soya from the amazon which if vegetable oil went that correct way would be five times worse and, and so we have to manage our choices with information and and, and and try to be try to make informed choices as much as possible um but whatever choices you make try to make choices rather than just eat what's in front of you <laughs> yeah easy and that's great jake um it, my feelings around this is that we can make choices and, and us here can probably make those choices a lot of people probably don't have as many options they don't necessarily know what the choices are but also can't access it for, for financial reasons or whatever reasons and we need to realize that as a society and actually start making it so that it, people don't have to, it's not just down to individual consumer choice because that's not going to change everything um, it there needs to be more uh, policy change. Uh, we, we're going to have to change how we use the land in this country. We need to plant more trees. I know that's not the whole solution, but we do know we need to do that. So we need to turn some of the land that we're farming cattle on over to something else, or we need to turn it back to peat. So that actually might just drive those um, dietary changes anyway to an extent, I think. I'll leave it there. Yeah, thank you. No, I mean, and that gets us part way to a question that's been asked by one of our viewers as well. Um, you know, we've talked a lot there and so far tonight about choice, decisions, being informed, things we're doing locally because we want to and feel like they're important. But, um, you know, maybe that's not enough. Maybe that's not good enough. You know, Izzy just mentioned maybe it needs real policy change or does it need to go even further? Does it need legislation? You know? We've seen year in, year out, you know, for decades now that the situation's getting worse. It's not getting better uh, in all of these areas. And so, you know, is that what it's going to take, national, local level, um, and in terms of nature, biodiversity, rather than just climate? Um, the, from the question from the audience member, mandating wildlife protection and provision in new developments or banning paving, banning astroturfing gardens as examples any thoughts from the panel on those points? Yeah, Corinne. Yeah. One thing, one campaign which is currently happening is one to make globally, to make ecocide a crime. So that would include a lot of things which a lot of the oil companies are doing. So drilling up the Niger Delta to search for oil and just drilling oil exploration and things which will hugely harm people, the environment, animals, and just in general are kind of really awful. So at the moment, that is fully legal. You can just do that. And there's it's not a crime. It's just business. So it's really clear to see, if you see kind of the things that are happening, that it is really awful, hugely damaging, and is affecting uh, loads of life around where that's happening, but also in the whole world through the offshoots of climate change and that impact. So if this did become a law and we could make this kind of legal change internationally, then this could mean that we could actually have consequences and then make sure that this was measured in kind of the costs of things and that we could act on it. Anyone else? Jake? Yeah. Um, so, so some wildlife and some biodiversity does really well alongside us. And, and that sort of if we if we put things out for it and, and, and give it some space within where we are, it works very well. And, and so you have winners within within our sort of our human society, if you like, wildlife that, that will live alongside us very happily. Um, but a, a large proportion of biodiversity, particularly the ones under threat, need that that more mature or that old growth forest that 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 system that needs protection that do, that doesn't work very well with 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 human society alongside it. And in those cases, I think sort of very strict protection work is required to, to manage that. 
Um, and so if you're thinking generally about managing landscapes for biodiversity, I think there are species, there are ecosystems that do require that, that, that strict regulation. Um, and then going to the other side of this, this sort of comment about things like AstroTurf, I think there are some things that are generally bad ideas and, and, and reinforce our disconnection with nature. Um, it, 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 it's, it's the equivalent of, of magazine images, I think. And, and, and I think that's what drives the use of them. And, and, and if we look wider across the globe, or even, even across the country, even across the UK, um, there are communities who are very happy with lawns that have lots of different species in that aren't aren't perfectly the same height and all green all year round and, and don't have any moss. So some communities are very happy with very diverse lawns and use them as beautiful lawns that also support biodiversity. So the Afro turf is the other end of that where we're trying to sort of make everything fit our image and, and perhaps we need to change that image a little bit. Yeah. Great. Anyone else or should we move on? Wait, you know, time is getting on. We don't have long left. Um, what I'm going to attempt to do now is uh, rattle through a few questions. So let me try this as an experiment. Um, in, in this order, I'll give you a moment to prep panellists. Um, Jake, I would like to know a bit more about what the role of citizen science might be in helping. Jamie, you mentioned a few minutes ago wilder communities. I've heard I've heard of wilder Portsmouth and wilder Isle of Wight. Um, is there going to be a wilder Southampton? Question mark. And Izzy, um, we've seen a lot on social media and in the news recently locally about the airport expansion. Um, is it a negative story? Are there any positives in the outcome? Um, that's your question. And Corin. Could you start us off on, um, you know, there's going to be some negatives. We've talked a lot about the pessimistic side of this so far. Um, what can people do to help nature? So firstly, Jake. OK, yeah, so, yeah, citizen science and the, and the contribution that citizen science can make. I think this, this is twofold. One. Um, that connection with nature and, 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 and making it more available and, and connecting people to the practice of conservation and, and, and sort of the, the science of, of biodiversity. Um, there are projects that one, one sort of great site is, is the Zooniverse site. And this, this Zooniverse site has lots and lots of, of, of projects, not all biodiversity related, but there's some fantastic biodiversity ones um, where scientists are putting up data. We often we collect so much data that we, we can't, get through it, we can't manage it. There's a huge time lag to what academics do, to what conservation practitioners um, need on the ground and, 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 and trying to get that sort of science into practice as fast as possible. There's a huge workforce out there in terms of citizen science who can really help with that data processing and data collection. And so projects um, and sites like Zooniverse can really help like that. And then there's a whole array of projects from the acoustic ones. So we've got a project they're looking at, at forest sounds that you can identify um, whether some a shotgun sound or all the different bird sounds or whether it's a monkey or something calling in the forest where we, we don't have the, the, the means to identify those. And, and by capturing the, 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 the citizens, the crowd, to do that, it speeds the whole process up and allows us to, to implement the practice, um, the conservation practice, the, the result of that faster. Um, and then the, the other side is, is that connection with nature and, and, and getting out and, and volunteering to the, the, the community volunteers that Corey mentioned, or, or uh, as Jamie mentioned, get the, the, the value, conservation costs money and, and actually having a workforce to help with, with this process um, does help. Um, but it also reinforces that connection with nature. Yeah, we can all help. Thank you, Jake. Jamie? Yeah, I can confirm there will be a wilder Southampton programme rolling out later in this year. So there's lots of exciting conversations happening um, with a few notable organisations, um, and it's looking very positive and very exciting. So watch this space. Right, short and sweet, but yeah, it, it is happening. Okay, great. And I think there might be a link that pops up to the, the, the website with information there too. Uh, over to Izzy. So uh, Southampton Airport, um, just a little bit of background. Southampton Airport wants to extend the length of their, their runway so that they can be more attractive to low cost carriers who want to be able to fly that little bit further um, on sort of holiday flights. Um, it was up to Eastleigh Council 
uh, which is a local authority, to decide on this, decide, despite it being um, having regional impact in terms of particularly noise um, and to an extent air pollution, um, potentially traffic too, and obviously global impact because aviation is, is a huge contributor to climate change. Um, so it seems on the face of it quite a negative story because despite declaring a climate and ecological emergency, the council voted to extend um, the runway. However, uh, the, the positive, there, there are so many positives that we can take from it. Um, the start, I wasn't involved particularly in the campaigning from the start, but it's, it started off looking like it was a, you know, a dead cert that this would happen, but Southampton Council decided that they um, would vote against it, that they wanted to oppose it. Winchester similarly. So we've got local councils who are already sort of saying no on, on plenty of grounds, not only the impact it will have on our, our own residents, but also the global environmental impacts. And in fact, uh, a third of Eastleigh Council voted against it. And I think the really powerful thing that I took from the 19 hours of meeting on which that was decided was the speeches that were made by those councillors who were opposing it because they were saying things that you wouldn't have heard a local councillor say um, possibly even six months ago but certainly not 18 months ago about the our obligation to people around the world and our obligation to future generations so I think there's the positive story in that that things are changing, the tide is turning, um, and there's more happening. So uh, if, if anyone wants to get involved in the um, campaign to, ex to oppose the expansion, I think there'll be a link appearing for um, the AXO website, which has got information about how you can find out more. Yeah, there it is popping up. Thank you, Izzy. And as I hand over to Corinne, um, I'll throw it to the other panellists as well after Corinne has finished to mop up anything else. What can people do to help nature? Yeah, so I say there's kind of three main areas which are the individual things in your own life. So individually, the things that make the biggest impacts are around, or mostly to climate, are more around uh, what you eat, uh, heating, which uses huge amounts of energy, and travel, which also uses a lot of energy. Uh, so if you can make sure you don't waste food and try to eat more plant-based options, that's kind of a quite easy change to make that has quite a big impact. And you can see the impact as well because you see less in your bin being thrown away and that kind of thing. Uh, and making sure just to put a hoodie on instead of turning the heating up is also a great way of reducing heating and trying to have plants in your house. And if you're lucky enough to have a garden, in your garden as well. Uh, and then try to do things virtually, try to meet locally and try to travel less and enjoy your local community more. The second way is uh, within your community. So you can do things like tree planting, litter picks, uh, conservation tasks, or just uh, making friends with people in your community and going for walks around the park and getting involved in nature and seeing animals and saying, oh, that's a cute animal. And just being aware of nature makes you care more about it and makes them care more about it and it influences both of you. So those kind of community events are really important in kind of making that change and getting people's mindsets to change. And then also targeting governments and corporations and trying to get them to act. So emailing MPs, uh, tweeting corporations saying, is this your letter? Why do you have, why is there a Coke bottle here? Uh, and making those kinds of statements because uh, companies have a reputation and keep them carefully and try to make sure they have a good reputation and if everyone hates them, then they don't like that. So do publicly call them out when they do bad things. It takes a while, but it does get noticed. And then you can also influence by protesting. So uh, things like school strikes. So it's children missing school, which is a bad thing. So you don't want children to miss school. And I think it's awful. But now at this point, there's kind of no other option. And Greta and all the children who go on school strikes don't see any other option and it is their last choice and it makes news because people don't want it and it affects people and because they don't want children to miss school because it's not great and similar with protests of roadblocks and things like I've seen ones where people would uh, smash the windows of Shell which damage is bad and blocking roads is bad because it affects people but uh, the things that 
make difference and make people notice are the ones that make that difference. So if a protest is kind of on a pavement and no one sees it, then no one will notice the protest. It won't make any media and it won't get corporations to care because it's not costing, costing them any money. So protest does make a difference. It has worked historically in the past with Martin Luther King, Gandhi, and all of those kind of people and they've made huge differences so you can influence corporations you can influence governments and you can make those changes okay um we don't have long left uh jake jamie and then izzy in that order if you wanted to add anything to corinne's points on how can we help nature so, so two um very briefly one I, I i think we should all draw a bit of nature um, connect to it in a small way. Um, I think, think the world of us drawing out there, drawing, drawing nature, or even in your homes, draw a bit of nature. Um, and then the other scale, and I see from the comments, the worry about that individual actions, how far can they actually go? That connection to the wider the wider network, the wider policymakers, um, the politicians. Um, do voice your views. Um, I, people do listen. Great. Jamie? Yeah. Go out, find it, experience it, respect it, look after it. Um, very simple messages. And you can do that anywhere. Go and hug a tree in a city. You know, it will give you a warm, fuzzy feeling inside. Um, there are opportunities everywhere. You just might have to look a little bit harder sometimes. Great. Izzy? I think we should talk about this much more. So talk about the nature that you're experiencing with everyone that you meet to make the changes that are happening in nature, something that's part of our daily lives. It's the elephant in the room right now. Let's address it. Um, let's then find the language around how we feel about it, because it's really hard to talk about that, that emotional side that is affecting us. Um, and I think finally, talk about how you want to see the world change. So tell those stories about the amazing things that could happen if we make the right changes. Yeah, great. You know, I mean, we've covered it there, I think, panel. Well done. Um, being a voice for change it can be powerful as well as your personal actions. And, um, you know, Jamie covered it. He stole my thunder there, the thing I've been saying throughout. Uh, so I won't repeat it except that final um, tagline that I showed you on my last slide at the beginning. The, the more we value nature, the more we'll want to save it. Biodiversity is critical to our well-being and we all need to help protect it. So just as we draw to a close, I'd like to um, give an opportunity finally to each of the panelists in turn, if they do have any closing remark they'd like to make. So, Jake. Yeah, I think one of the things we've been hearing about throughout this this, this discussion is is the messaging, and 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 harnessing that messaging, and I I, I think um, looking out for it, seeing it, feeling it. I like I like the emotional touch that Lizzie was mentioning. And, and and passing it on i think it's really important great jamie yeah i think there's a great quote from barack obama which basically says we are the first we are the first generation to feel the effects of climate change and the last generation who can do something about it so i think that's really key and then my my closing one is we should give a damn as my t-shirt says um and respect nature look after it and enhance it Thank you, Jamie. Corin? Yeah, so I just want to say it is a hugely difficult thing to solve uh, both climate and ecological crisis. But if we can make these changes, if we do act now and get this change, then that will be a huge thing. It will be so amazing. It will show that humanity can work together and solve an issue that's kind of so hard to see and so hard to fix. And I think that will just be an amazing thing we could do. Thank you. Izzy? I'm going to completely misquote um, Rebecca Solnit, but she says something like, um, uh, most environmental victories seemed like nothing ever happened. And that's what we want to get to. Exactly. Yeah. Well, listen, thank you so much, panellists. Uh, you've added some great contributions throughout the evening there to really give a, a nice picture of, you know, not only what the issues are, but what we can all do about it. Uh, and thanks for everyone. Uh, who's watched this this evening or will do in the recording that follows. Uh, it will be available afterwards, so do share this with others as well. Um, 
what else can I say? I suppose one thing I really wanted to do is let you know that there is a, little, a really short survey that we've made. And that I think the link to that and the code you need to complete it is about to appear in the comments. It'd be really lovely to hear not only what your thoughts are on tonight's event, but also there's a couple of questions on your thoughts about nature and biodiversity. So we'd love to, to hear your thoughts as well. If you fill that in for us, that would be great. Um, there is an event tomorrow night. There's a there's there's a, there's there's a link here, so bear with me. Tomorrow is World Book Night, everyone, and you know that's another thing we love, isn't it? Is books because we learn so much about uh, the world and, and and what we can do from them. There's another project we run here in Southampton called the Research Cafe, and to mark World Book Night tomorrow, we're running Research Cafe number forty, and it's another free online event you can come to if you like. And the reason why it links to tonight's event is we've got the great Philip Hoare talking about his new book, Albert and the Whale. Uh, so you can get that book if you want, but you can also hear him talking about it tomorrow evening at seven uh, on some of these same channels. And, you know, Albrecht Dürer, the famous artist from 500 years ago, really changed how we see nature through his art uh, and the fragile beauty of the natural world. So if you want to hear more about that, come to tomorrow's event. Um, and this event tonight has been put on by the Nature and Biodiversity Community Hub that we have here in Southampton, which is another great way that you can kind of connect with other people and, and do your bit to help. So if you'd like further information about that and how to sign up, again, look in the comments because that's been shared just now. Another thing the hub is doing is on Saturday, we're running a biodiversity game show uh, in the daytime. And this will be child friendly as well. So if that's something you're interested in, the link is appearing. Another thing the hub is doing, looking a little bit further ahead, is the next thing in the calendar after Earth Day today is World Environment Day. And that falls on the 5th of June. Again, it's a global time that we mark, um, you know, how we can help the environment. Uh, and again, the hub is hoping to do something physical in the real world for this. Uh, up at the Winchester Science Centre, they have a biospace outdoors and the hub and some people from Southampton who are members of the hub are going to go up to the outdoor space of Winchester Science Centre on that day, Saturday, the 5th of June. And so you can engage with us further there. It's National Marine Week at the end of July. Uh, and of course, as we mentioned, it's COP26 in November. And so we'll see what other things we can we can do to keep talking about these important issues then. So it all, all it remains for me to say uh, tonight now is thanks again to the panelists and thanks everyone for coming along. Good night. <laughs>